So what I uh, feel inspired to talk about this morning is generosity. And generosity is one of the four central practices in our particular Buddhist tradition or school. And those four practices are mindfulness, ethics, loving kindness, and generosity. So sati, sila, um, uh, metta, and dana. And um, uh, these four qualities of the practice are not just practices that people do, but they become kind of qualities of the heart or they are manifestation of the good heart that kind of reveals itself as we kind of deepen or open up in this practice here. So much so that uh, to my surprise, uh, because of my background and and upbringing, I kind of uh, relate to these four as kind of sacred. They're sacred qualities. They're very special and... and, um, uh, there's a certain kind of feeling of reverence inside or a feeling of care, caring for them or a, for a certain kind of feeling for um, there's a wholeness in life with these four qualities kind of circulating around and operating together and that the absence of them or not having them uh, just seems like uh, I'd be bereft or or I don't know if bereft is the right word, but I'd feel something was really deeply uh, off, off kilter or askew or somehow in my heart. And um, so they're really kind of central uh, to this tradition and certainly to how I've evolved as a person in this tradition. The, um, and generosity is one of them. Uh, there's a wonderful little story, fable maybe, so once in Bud- Buddhist story, once upon a time, there was a monk who uh, had very few possessions and had a old patchwork robe that he wore and often slept outside under trees. But he, uh, one of his uh, students was the king of the land who had uh, given him a golden begging bowl because uh, Buddhist monastics will travel around with a alms bowl, and when the lid is not on, that means they're available for people who would like to put food in it so that they can have food, otherwise they don't eat. So he had a golden one. So one day, uh, he was going to uh, lay down to sleep outside in one of these places where he sleeps outdoors. And, and he saw that lurking uh, behind a few trees nearby was uh, a person who was intent on stealing his bowl. Because it was gold, right? So uh, he, he uh, got up and went over to the person and handed him the bowl. <laughs> and he, and uh, now I don't have, here, you know, now I don't have to worry about you at night. <laughs> Something like that. And the person couldn't believe his good luck and ran off and and then the next morning, when the monk woke up, uh, the thief was there and um, with the bowl and said, I want to return this bowl, but um, uh, uh, I've never met anyone who has this kind of freedom to be able to give away and offer something like this of such great value as if you had no need for it. And somehow I felt that you, you had greater wealth because you gave it to me, sir. And so I want to learn what you know. So I'm here to be your student. That's a nice story, I think. So, um, the, um, and one of my joys in my life is not only learning generosity, but I learned a lot of it because I was a recipient of it. And pretty much every stage of practice that I did in Buddhism uh, there was some kind of way that I felt I was recipient of the practice, um, recipient of a lot of goodness and support and all kinds of things. And uh, 
it was very clear that uh, in the early years of practice that uh, the people who were my teachers were just not doing it to become wealthy, that they, there was an abundance of generosity in their teaching and their time and their dedication to try to offer the opportunities that I had. Uh, it was clear that uh, when I was in Japan, that uh, practicing the monasteries there, that there was a tremendous outpouring of support for uh, the people who are practicing. And, and um, the kind of the wonderful story uh, that kind of epitomized this for me was I had very little money when I went to Japan to practice. I was there for, for a year with something like $200, $250. And um, I decided that, uh, you know, the reasonable thing to do when you have that little money is to get a job. And so I decided to... Um, it was pretty easy to teach English in Japan back then. So I'd set up to do a teach English uh, and had a job. But I had a week or two, a couple of weeks before it started. So I went off to a Zen monastery to do a retreat. And, um, and uh, during that retreat, I said, I didn't come to Japan. I was already ordained as a Zen priest and monk. So I didn't come to Japan to teach English. I came to practice Buddhism. So... I don't know if this is going to work, but I'll take my chances. So uh, I decided that when I came back f- to Kyoto, I would cancel my job. So that is in the middle of the retreat. So at the end of the retreat, there was, uh, it was retreat was offered freely at a monastery, but there was a custom that you would, at the end, if you were a visitor, that you would put a little bit of money in a very nice little envelope and go to the abbot and make this offering. And it wasn't really expected that it would be much money in it, uh, one monastery I practiced in here in the United States uh, where they had this custom, I was told to get go to the bank and get three brand new dollar bills, one dollar bills, and put them in those special envelope. And at the end of retreat, go and give the abbot that three dollars. <laughs> but there's something about the envelope, the newness of it, that kind of made it kind of a ritual, kind of a, much more was being expressed than than just, you know, you know, th- throwing a little ball of dollar bills in the direction of the teacher. So there was a custom. So I put in money uh, for th- in gratitude for having done the retreat. And we talked for a while. And it became clear that uh, I used to have, I was ordained by a Zen master, but um, <coughs> due to circumstances, I no longer had him as my teacher. So I was a masterless Zen monk. <coughs> and it turned out that in Japan... Uh, there's a custom of supporting masterless Zen monks by giving them train money so they can go look for a master. <laughs> and so, um, so we were talking a little bit about this and it was clear I was leaving. I wasn't asking him to be my master, the, the abbot. And so he said, just wait a minute. And he went to the back room and a few minutes later he came back with an envelope and he handed it to me. And um, so I, I, he, I left him with my envelope, and he gave me with my envelope, and and um, and uh, his envelope had more money in it than I had my envelope, <laughs> and um, my train money. So so here I, I made this decision to devote myself to the practice, and the first kind of kind of the first thing that happened in, once I left the retreat was this wonderful. Here I was re- I didn't expect it. I received support for my. Uh, exploring, pursuing the practice, and um, and so so it went for me that uh, it, over and over again in my life, where it seemed like it was risky to choose the Dharma over the reasonable things to do, and I chose the Dharma practice. Somehow things came together to offer support, and um, so I feel because of that, I feel changed by that experience. I feel I'm inspired by it. In Burma, when I practiced in Burma, and people would come and uh, sometimes they came and offered just a little bit of food for us, uh, the Westerners who were practicing there. And uh, it was clear that some of the people offered us little food, little things, were pretty poor. And I was so inspired by this that um, uh, I said, I have to practice now for them, you know, for their sake. I have to kind of be worthy of what's been given to me. And it wasn't a burden, those feelings. It was actually kind of, kind of made my heart sing. Like, okay, okay, now, it's not just for me. It's, uh, you know, but yeah, I've got to try harder here or apply myself more. And uh, just delighted by it all. 
And um, so if you go all the way back to the time of the Buddha, there's a lot of emphasis on the value of generosity and giving. Uh, the Buddha said something like, if you knew the benefits that come from offering the generous gifts, you wouldn't let a single meal go by without sharing it somehow. And uh, it was a wonderful, when I was a, a Zen monk for years, uh, we would eat in the meditation hall in a kind of ritual way. And, um, and they were chanting and eating and bowing and all kinds of things. But uh, at the end of the meal, you, or the, during that course of that ritual eating, you had to always take a little bit of the food that you received and put it on a little stick you had with you and your, next to your bowl and put it there. And then they would come along, uh, people who served you the food, and they'd collect a little morsel of, you know, something you put there. And they'd collect it all from all the people who were eating. And then uh, they'd go off and offer it s- someplace in nature. They'd put it out in the woods or something for the critters or something. It's an offering. Uh, symbolizing this idea, you don't never eat something, you never receive something without then turning around and offering it back. And um, it was a ritual, and the amount of food that went out to those critters out there was pretty small. But uh, s- the symbolically to feel this exchange that we're connected to the natural world, the non-human world, this wider world, and that we're living kind of in a, in a mutual exchange, in a relationship to it, uh, slowly, slowly dawned on me. <laughs> by every day doing this little ritual. You know, was, you know, I'm a slow learner sometimes, but, but it was, it had a, you know, over time it had a big impact on me. And Buddhism, uh, especially through the monastic community, is set up to be a gift economy. And a gift economy is very different than a commercial consumer economy, where you, you know, just have money and buy. A gift economy has a lot to do with the relationship, the field of relationships you're in. Uh, a gift is something that's offered generously in relationship to the contact, the relationship people have with each other. And it's a feedback system uh, of care, of support, of respect, of, uh, of generosity, that um, uh, to be intact, everyone has to kind of play their parts. So for monastics, they have to be ethical, they have to be worthy for generosity, they have to, people have to see them that they're practicing up, uprightly and well and they're ethical and maybe that they're kind and a variety of things. And if they aren't, then people aren't inspired to offer them food. And um, also the monastics have to be in relationship with the laity because the idea is that if you receive something from them, you're supposed to offer something back And the only thing that monastics can offer back is, they're allowed to offer really, is teaching. And so there's this reciprocity of giving and and taking. It puts them in kind of personal contact with each other. A kind of uh, commercial consumer uh, economy that we have here in this country, um, all you need to do is have money. You have a relationship with money and where your your goods come from, uh, who produced them, has very little bearing. It's very easy to ignore all that. Where your goods go after you finish with them and you put them in the trash or something, has, can, it's so easy not to give any thought to that. Money, and the money exchange of money, creates, the fl- creates a very different system of exchange than a gift economy. Uh, there's so much that's lost in the relationship to the natural world, to the human world, to each other, that doesn't simply, doesn't happen. Now, maybe that's why some people prefer it, because some people don't want to be in relationship to the world and other people too much, uh, especially if you have to share with them. And it's just kind of, it's more, uh, you know, it's some, for some people it's fear involved and it's better just to be kind of in your own little world. Some people, <clears throat> it's greed that's involved. I just want it for myself and I just want to have benefit myself and not have to think about anybody else at all. And, I deserve it after all. So I, mean, I don't know if those my analysis is you know filled out very well, but it might be, it's it's very interesting to consider the difference between a gift economy and a commercial economy. And uh, Buddhism, over down through the centuries, <coughs> has <coughs> primarily existed in a gift economy, 
where uh, the whole exchange of generosity is built into the fabric that keeps it going and supports it and makes it, makes it happen. <clears throat> so this, uh, the practice of generosity uh, has a lot of uh, aspects to it. So one aspect is, in terms of what I just said now, is what it does in terms of establishing healthy social relationships. And often it's said in Buddhism that generosity is the first practice that people practice. It's the gateway into Buddhism. And if that's the case, then the gateway into Buddhism is not a personal exploration for your own sake, but immediately puts you in a field of related, relatedness, relatingness to other people. Because you, you know, yeah, generally, I guess you can be generous to yourself, but that's very, you know, that could easily be confused with selfishness. But the, uh, but generally, generosity is done outwards to others. It's a giving, a connecting to others, and so uh, it's establishing the field of practice, your Buddhism, that it's something that's interrelated, interrelated, interrelated to people. Like in our tradition, where we emphasize so much meditation, oh, uh, sit down and close your eyes, it uh, can lend itself to a feeling of being self-involved in doing this practice, and even being selfish, and kind of uh, actually some people being disconnected and intentionally pulling back from those relationships and what goes on, and um, and that um, that might have its place and time to do some of that, but uh, the foundation of the liberation of Buddhism is one that um, keeps us compl- the heart completely open to the world of our relationship to people, people around us. The other aspect of uh, generosity is that um, it's a practice. And as a practice, it's very interesting, and they say it this way, that um, generosity is non-obligatory. If it's obligatory, it's not generous. So there's a kind of a, the, to be non-obligatory means that it comes a little bit from place of free, or very much from place of freedom inside, or openness, or goodness, or, or uh, you know, self-motivatingly. It just feels good or feels right. If it's an obligation, uh, then it's giving, but it's not generous. Now, Giving is not bad, <laughs> you know. The non-generous giving is not, doesn't have doesn't have to be generous. But here, here is where it gets interesting in terms of Buddhist practice. It's possible to take up the practice of giving because we think we realize or understand that the practice of doing it uh, is beneficial in a variety of different ways. So, deciding to be generous. To deciding, to deciding to give, you get to see and look at, it's a mirror for, uh, to show you all the ways you don't want to give. You say, well, I'm not very generous, I'm actually miserly, or I'm too afraid to give, or I'm too annoyed with that person to give, or it's just all this stuff that goes on. There's a rich inner world that exists that, that interferes with our generosity. And it's really good to learn what that interference is. And so to practice be giving, even when you don't want to, can, can if you, and, it, and if you do it with mindfulness for this purpose, really reveals a lot of what's going on inside of us. This is actually very important because uh, generosity can be seen as an ideal a beautiful ideal, but it's possible to be oppressed by ideal, ideals. It's possible to have this big, like, I don't live up to it, I'm supposed to be this way, and I'm not, and, and now I have to kind of force myself to be generous, and it just kind of very quickly becomes, you know, kind of a mess with ideals. But one of the values of ideals is to help us see how we don't live up to the ideal meaning what interferes with the ideal. And that's actually a great lesson. Because if you see how you're selfish, see how you might be greedy or miserly, see how you're afraid of other people, see how 
you, you know, all kinds of things about yourself, then you have a chance to work through it. You have a chance to look at it and take an inventory and decide, is this really how I want to li- live my life? Is this really the best for, for me? And if you work through that, you still don't have to be generous. <laughs> in fact, it might be that the circumstance you're in doesn't call for generosity. It's the wrong ideal. And if you thought the ideal was to be generous, you could give in the wrong situations. But working through the obstacles to generosity gives us a lot more ability to kind of come, come from many places, not just from a generous place. So to practice giving as a mirror, as a challenge. And then many years ago, there was a teacher I know who uh, encouraged people to go around in their wallet or in their pocket with a $20 bill. And he, the practice was, find someone you don't know during the next week to give it to. And, uh, and the pro- back then, $20 is more like maybe $50 now. And so, you know, it's like $50? I mean, uh, you know, who do I give it to? And why do I give it? And, and all these different issues come up, personal issues, interpersonal issues, in that reflection about who should I give this to and why and how and all these things. And, um, and this is kind of the practice of giving for the benefit of understanding ourselves better. The practice of giving also can teach us something about letting go and how wonderful it is to not be holding on and the joy of opening up, the joy of stepping forward kind of with an open hand, open arms here, freeing something inside of us. And there's a way of giving that is freeing. There's a way of giving which uh, is done with something, a profound feeling of reverence for our life. So the example of when I was in Japan, when this envelope was given to the teacher, when I did that, there was a feeling of something special going on. There was much more than just, you know, my generosity. There was also a human connectedness and care that goes on there that uh, has some depth to it as well. The the Buddha gave um, some instructions about how uh, to give. So this kind of interesting list. One gives a gift carefully. By maybe that means thoughtfully with consideration. Remember, this is 2,500 years ago before they had PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one gives it with one's own hand. So that, you know, so this per- really could do it in a personal way, in a way that we're kind of in it or connected to it or it's wholehearted. And um, so even if we use, you know, a credit card or something or some other way, send in a check sometime, uh, what, 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 what would be the equivalent of doing it with, with our hands? To, you know, to really kind of do it in an intentional, embodied way, like you're really doing it there for it. One gives it showing respect that somehow respect for the other person is part of it. Um, One gives a valued gift. I think that just means that we feel that it's useful, important, valuable. Um, So those are some ideas about how to give. But there were some other wonderful ones, I thought. Um, Oh, there was one... um, There was also, the Buddha said that uh, one should give a, uh, a gift in such a way to not uh, demean the other person or not uh, disrespect the other person or denigrate the other person. It's because sometimes gifts can f- do funny things in relationships to each other. So to give in such a way that the, to respect the person but not to denigrate the person in any way. The Buddha also talked about a, a variety of motivations for giving. Um, there's a two sets of eight. Uh, one can give spontaneously. I'm not sure what that means, but maybe it just means without any thought. One can give out of fear to reciprocate a gift 
in the hope to receive a gift in return, by thinking it is good to give, by thinking it's improper to deny food to a monastic who who has none, in order to get a good reputation, and because it, it ennobles the mind, adorns the mind. So that last category is kind of interesting. And uh, this next list, um, some of it repeats, but the last one is also interesting. One gives out of affection, one gives in anger, one gives out of stupidity, one gives out of fear, one gives to maintain a family tradition, one gives in order to have a favorable rebirth, one gives by giving, by give, by, by gives by believing that by giving my heart will be glad and happiness and joy will arise in me. One gives in order to ennoble the mind and adorn the mind. So it's the same last one. And, um, and it's, the tradition says this last one is the best reason to give. Which is kind of strange, uh, you know, a little odd. Why is, why is that the best one? Shouldn't it be better for the sake of the other person? And why is this the best reason? Um, they also say that uh, when we ennoble or adorn the mind, we're preparing the mind to practice uh, insight and concentration. It's preparing the mind for um, to do something really good. And the idea of adorning the mind is to create a mind that has no static. <laughs> <laughs> It's adorning the mind is to create a, mi- a mind that um, is open, unagitated, clear, available for the world, kind of open. And maybe other ways. It's a beautiful thing, a liberated mind. So one can give as a practice. One can give for a variety of reasons. The third reason for giving is as an expression of generosity. Or I like to think of it as an expression of our freedom. Buddhism puts a tremendous emphasis on the capacity to be unencumbered by attachments, by craving, by compulsion, unencumbered by fear, selfishness, stinginess, and this idea of being unencumbered, to have cast off uh, the shackles or the tightness or the restrictions, that, uh, the heaviness, the burdens the, that we can live under, uh, creates a heart, a mind that's very open, very clear, very transparent, very free. And, um, and, and so, Generosity is becomes an expression of that, or a manifestation of that. And some Buddhist traditions say that when generosity is given in this kind of way, as an expression or as a manifestation of our inner freedom, uh, the idea that there is a giver, a receiver, and gift kind of disappear in the process. The self-consciousness of me being a giver even though genera- giving is happening, me, that it's about me, myself, and mine, the self-consciousness kind of disappears. It just feels like this is the nature of reality, that there's giving going on here. It's just a flow. And the idea that the other person is a, you know, we certainly we can respect the person, but the idea that there's a receiver, the freedom of giving, it's not like there's nothing being given. It, it's kind of like maybe in a family, right? In a family sometimes... You know, you, a family member might make supper for the rest of the family. It's an act of generosity, but are we doing it for the other or is it doing it for the big we? It was just, this is just what we do for each other. It's not like an issue or it's not like a feeling of separation or something. It's just, you know, we're, we're all in it together. This is just, just as much yours as is mine. 
One of the formative experiences I had in my life was when I was 17 and I uh, had the occasion to bum around Europe with four friends with almost no money. And, uh, and it was remarkable how we all just shared whatever we had. There was no sense of anybody had anything different. There was no, no p- personal possessions. It was like no, something belonged to one person, not the other. And it was quite hard to go back to high school after that, and uh, where my high school friends in America had no sense of this kind of idea that we're all kind of, you know, it's all kind of our shared. It's not belongs to anyone. And um, so a liberated heart has the ability to give with a sense of giver, receiver, and even the gift kind of fall away in that freedom and that openness and that simplicity of just giving, generosity. And that's a bit of an ideal to do it that way. But sometimes by giving, we're exercising that. We might have some sense of freedom, some sense of inner goodness and what it's like to be generous or or to let go and just kind of, just to give in this kind of very open way where there's no giver, receiver, and a gift. Something in us might know the joy of that or the rightness of that or the, the naturalness of that. And so sometimes it's helpful to act on that or stretch that, go beyond, just beyond what we're comfortable with in order to act, kind of stretch that or open it up or grow it or expand it. Chall- you know, so we're more challenged. So our freedom, whatever degree of freedom we have, challenges us to stretch, to expand it to become more and more what's here. So, this idea of generosity, or the practice of generosity, the expression of generosity, um, for me, it kind of feels like a sacred part of life, or our life, or certainly our practice. And uh, I feel like it's benefited me tremendously, and freed me tremendously, and brought a tremendous joy and delight uh, as I go through my life and I live. I, I would be kind of, I, my guess is I'd be feeling, I'd be very bereft if it wasn't here, that capacity and that, that aspect. So, um, to be generous, to be giving. So what I'd like to do, since we have this uh, tea today, and also because I think it'd be nice for each of you to have something to say about this topic. If you could uh, share with one or two people next to you something, uh, uh, a simple example from your entire life of a situation, a person, where you learned something about the value of generosity. Did you have any lesson in the course of your lifetime about the benefits, the specialness, the wonderfulness of generosity. And just, you know, maybe you can share that simple thing with your friend here and then maybe say hello and offer your name and welcome them here. And then in about probably 10 minutes or so, there'll be the, the tea and the snack and um, which has been generously offered by Sangha members. Thank you. And... Um, and uh, maybe you'll join to, with a snack where there's n- no giver.